What's up everyone, it's Jasmine. Today's episode of The Slain Project is part two of The Highway of Tears. If you have not listened to episode one, I encourage you to go back to do so. Now, I'm going to start off the video by speaking of a suspect that has not really ever been brought up. He was a semi-truck driver and he was in Canada in 1985. And I'm also going to link some more tarot card readings down below if that is something that you're interested in. And if you want to see more videos on missing and murdered Indigenous people, click that subscribe button and the notification bell. Now let's get right into it. A lot of investigators signaled in on the serial killer theory, even though the work of a serial killer was largely denied. Known serial killers along the highway include Bobby Jack Fowler, Brian Peter Arp, Edward Dennis Isaac, and Cody Lejbikoff. Even Ted Bundy, Henry Lee Lucas, and Gary Ridgway were considered as possible killers along Highway 16. Multiple serial killers are a known fact in the locality of the Highway of Tears. But I think that not enough consideration was given to the idea of one-off killings. If someone got a violent sexual urge, the temptation to pick someone up and kill them is too good to pass up. Especially if you know that law enforcement really won't care or investigate. Then there are people that the victim knew that could have killed them and also gotten away with it. Also consider the possibility that some may have traveled to the area on a sole purpose to kill someone. Sort of like a travel destination to feed your dark fantasies. One person who has not been brought up is Robert Ben Rhodes, also known as the truck stop killer. There was a photo of an indigenous woman found in his apartment after his final arrest. This person was on Facebook one day and recognized herself in a photo being shared. Her name is Pamela Milliken. She said in the spring of 1985, she started hitchhiking from Thunder Child First Nation, which is 235 kilometers northwest of Saskatoon. She was on her way to Winnipeg to find her brother. This trip was a total of about 1,015 kilometers. She made it all the way to White City, just outside of Regina and 512 kilometers from where she started. It just turned dark when Ben Rhodes stopped to pick her up in his semi. He was on his way to Brandon, Manitoba to drop off a load. This was 345 kilometers from White City. She got into the truck and he threw her bag in the back and that's when he snapped her picture. He claimed it was just in case she stole from him. But as they were riding along, Ben pointed to a sign on the dash that said, Cash, grass, or ass. No one rides for free. Pamela did not have any money or marijuana, so she knew what she had to do to pay for her ride. They pulled over and had consensual sex. He introduced himself as Robert. She also said that he wanted her to go to Florida with him and that he chatted all the way to Brandon and was very friendly. He then dropped her off in Winnipeg after he dropped off his load. She was unharmed, safe, and very lucky. Her photo was on the same roll of film that had pictures of a 14-year-old girl named Regina Walters. Rhodes had picked Regina and her boyfriend up in Texas in 1990. He killed her boyfriend and tortured Regina for weeks. He cut her hair and took photos of her in a barn in Illinois. This is where he killed her and left her body. Pamela called the FBI and her local RCMP to inform them that she was alive and well. They sent out an officer to verify her identity. Now, it has never been publicly released where else in Canada Rhodes has been. I am not even sure if there are any records of it, but it is possible that he could have traveled Highway 16. He definitely was in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, and he should be considered for any missing or murdered people in those areas. 
This guy was everywhere and he eventually converted his truck's sleeping quarters into a traveling torture chamber. He was sentenced to two life sentences and is currently in an Illinois state prison. Now the following cases are just some of the additional cases along Highway 16. The exact number of missing and murdered cases is unknown. Please comment any people I have missed and a little bit about them in the comments section down below so that they could also be a part of this video. Helen Frost Helen and her older sister Sandy were born in England and moved to Nanaimo when they were four and five years old. The girls were very close and spent a lot of time together. In the summer of 1967, they got jobs berry picking in Abbotsford. The following summer, they were in Penticton, where they hitchhiked and slept outside. In 1969, when Helen was 16, she moved to Prince George and went back to Nanaimo to visit her family that November. Her sister Sandy went back with her to Prince George. When she went home for this visit, Helen was three months pregnant but did not tell her parents. In the spring of 1970, Helen went to a home for unwed mothers in Kamloops. This was a common thing to do for the era. She gave birth in May 1970 and planned on naming the baby Sandra. But the baby was taken from her right at birth. She never got a chance to hold her. Helen and the baby's father soon broke up after this. Helen returned to Prince George in August 1970. It is unknown what she did between May and August. Sandy had a new roommate by then who was pregnant at the time. The sisters went to visit their parents that summer and swung by Kamloops to see if Helen could get her baby back. Helen came out crying and the subject was never brought up again. Helen found a job painting gas stations along Highway 16 and did not return until October 1970. Sandy's new roommate had her baby by then, and they were all living in the apartment together. The apartment was only nine blocks from Highway 16. On the night of October 13, 1970, at about 8 p.m., Sandy came home and Helen wanted to go on a walk and talk. Sandy said it was too cold, so Helen said she would go on a walk by herself. She never returned and was reported missing two days later. Sandy always wonders what Helen was going to say to her that night on that walk. Helen's ex-boyfriend was questioned about her disappearance and cleared. Helen's daughter eventually obtained her birth certificate to learn more about her birth mother. She found out about Helen missing and made contact with Sandy. When Helen went missing, it was only four days before her 18th birthday. Sandy was hopeful that Helen would have made the Epana list to garner more information about her disappearance. Helen left behind her clothing, money, and her ID. She was last seen wearing a long navy blue jacket with a fur trim hood and blue pants. She was experienced in hitchhiking. Jean Virginia Ginny Samper Jean's family called her by her middle name, Virginia, Ginny for short. Ginny had just turned 18 in September 1971 and lived at home with her parents in Gitsagula. She worked at a local fish cannery with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was missing at the time and was later found drowned in the Skeena River after Ginny disappeared. Her parents provided a nice home. Ginny was the second to the last of six kids. They frequently talked about suicide and warned their children not to harm themselves. Her parents had set a curfew of 9 p.m. and expected their kids still living at home to go to work. On the night of October 14, 1971, Ginny's sister-in-law Violet, who was married to her brother Roddy, was in the living room when Virginia's mom came home. She went to the back of the house where Ginny's room was. A few minutes later, Ginny came out from the back and appeared to be crying, and she headed straight out of the front door. This was between 10 and 11 p.m., and she did not even grab her jacket. Violet tried to go after her, but Ginny's mom stopped her 
and said to stay in because she had a newborn baby at the time. She reassured Violet that Ginny would be back. Violet remembers the front door was left unlocked so Ginny could get back in that night, but she never returned. After Ginny stormed out of the house, she began walking towards Highway 16. Her cousin Elvin, who lived nearby, crossed paths with her and they began walking. Elvin decided to run home and grab his bike. Ginny would usually walk to a store at the Skinner Crossing, and the cousin just assumed that was where she was going. It was about a mile away. Elvin left Ginny at an old bridge on Highway 16, just outside of Gitsagula. On his return, just before he got to the spot, he heard a car door slam and what sounded like a truck drive away. Ginny was not there, and no one has seen her since that night. Ginny's mom tried to report her missing right the next day, but there was confusion over a waiting period. The report was eventually taken a couple days later. In the meantime, her family searched the area. An official search did not start until the 20th. The RCMP did seem to take interest unlike so many other cases. They used helicopters and tracking dogs to look for her. Nothing was found. The search was called off on October 28th. Her missing persons case was reopened in 2001. Investigators collected DNA from her family around 2006. Just in case her DNA were to be found on Willie Picton's pig farm. Also, Jeannie's family learned in October 2017 that RCMP found footprints near the Gitsagula River back in 1971 and they think they were Ginny's. This was disclosed to the family 46 years later. The family is upset about this because they think that the RCMP concluded that she committed suicide. Ginny's parents talked openly about not solving problems this way. And Ginny did not know her boyfriend was dead yet because his body was not found until after she vanished. Ginny's mom fell ill with cancer and was given just one week to live. She was transported home to Gitsagula and lived three more months. While on her deathbed, she kept expecting Ginny to come and see her. Although that let her mom hold on to life for a few more months, she would never lay her eyes on Ginny ever again. Just like so many other families, Ginny's family is brokenhearted over her disappearance. They will accept her if she is alive or dead. They just want to bring her home. Pauline Morris Pauline disappeared one month before her 14th birthday and was the youngest member of her family. She attended Grassy Plains School in Grassy Plains, B.C., the school was known to have bullies that would pick on the indigenous children who attended classes there. On the day of March 14, 1978, Pauline was at school and had an earache and toothache. Instead of letting her go home, the school took it upon themselves to bring her to the hospital in Burns Lake. Pauline did not make it home that night and her mother went to the school first thing in the morning to see what was going on. They told her mom that she was brought to the hospital and dropped off at the ferry on the north side of Francois Lake. This location is about at the halfway point between Burns Lake and Grassy Plain where Pauline lived. The other side of the lake is known as Southside and is the location where the ferry should have dropped her off at. She had to walk the rest of the way home which was about 12 kilometers. Pauline was missing for four months before being discovered. Pauline's brother Ted said he was at camp when his cousin Dick Tom told him her body was found on July 5th, 1978. All Ted remembers after that is saying, good, they found her. Kind of like he went into a haze. Pauline's sister Laura had a more chilling account of when she learned her body was found. Laura was with her older sister Julia and they were in the ferry lineup in South Bank. They were headed to the hospital in Burns Lake because Julia had a doctor's appointment. Some ferry crewmen were moving a barge when Pauline's body floated out from underneath. 
Laura and Julia seen the commotion and wondered what was going on. The body was wrapped up in tarp, put in the back of a truck, and the truck pulled up behind the sisters on the ferry. They did not know that this was their sister Pauline at the time. Hospital staff saw Julia and knew that she was Pauline's sister, so they asked her to ID her body before she left the hospital that day. All Julia remembers is seeing her red shoes. The rest of the body was severely decomposed and unrecognizable. The sisters went home and told their mom, who also went up to identify the body. Some time passed and Ted and Laura grew a little older. They would soon hear rumors of what happened from various people. It always included the same group of Caucasian men that attended Grassy Plains School. They were part of the people known as bullies at the school. But the story goes that Pauline was sexually assaulted by these guys and she got up to run away when they were finished and she fell into the icy water. Ted says that there never was an investigation. News clippings from the time say that it was an accidental drowning. Almost all of the info I just shared came from Ted and Laura's testimony at the public hearings of the National Inquiry in October 2017. On the morning of their testimony, RCMP read them a coroner's report that said Pauline had a blood alcohol content of 0.11. The family never heard this and it was quite a shock because they said Pauline did not drink or smoke. Why did investigators wait nearly 40 years to tell the family this? Ted says they do not care because Pauline was just another dead Indian. Mary Jane Hill Mary was 31 years old when she was found dead and nude along Highway 16 on March 26, 1978. She was the mother to three children and was a bereaved mother of one. Her youngest daughter, Vicki, who was six months old when she died, is now searching for answers. She was raised by her dad's side of the family, who never told her anything about her mom. Vicki later lived in foster care from the age of 13. When she was in her early 20s, one of her uncles told her that he was with her mom the night she went missing. He said he was with her at a concert and when he turned around, she was gone. It is believed that Mary lived in Prince Rupert at the time of her death. RCMP told Vicki that her mom's clothing was found in an alley somewhere in Prince Rupert and that an older white vehicle is of interest. Seeing that it was 1978, the older vehicle was probably from the 1950s. Reports say that she was found between 20 and 32 kilometers east of Prince Rupert. It just depends at what source you look at. Now Vicki was told by EPANA investigators that her mom was not included on the official list because they cannot determine if foul play was involved. At least one historical news clipping contradicts this and a copy of the coroner's inquest makes things murky. An article dated March 28, 1978 says that Mary was found dead and nude at about 5 p.m. and that foul play is suspected. A second article dated April 1, 1978 says she died of natural causes but RCMP believes a crime was involved and further down the article, it says she died of exposure. In 2004, Vicki got a copy of the coroner's inquest of her mother's death. The report says that five jurors ruled Mary's cause of death as bronchitis and bronchopneumonia. But then the report also adds, quote, We then find the death of Mary Jane Hill as a result of manslaughter, end quote. I would also think the same thing. Someone who is sick does not end up nude and dead on the side of the road 20-something miles away from home. Vicki knows her mom was robbed of her life and done wrong by law enforcement who did not take special care into investigating her death. Looking at Mary's death from the outside in, you can clearly see that it seems very unnatural, but investigators do not seem to think so. 
Vicky has suffered so much because of her mother's death. Even though she does not remember her, she still feels the pain of her absence. She has been able to get the original copy of her mom's death certificate and find her mom's unmarked grave. She will never give up on uncovering the truth. Cecilia Nicol Cecilia is the cousin of another Highway of Tears victim, Delphi Nicol. I have seen a couple sources say that Cecilia was born in 1971. A lot of reports say that she was 15 when she went missing, but if 1971 is the correct birth year, then she was probably 17 or 18 when she disappeared in 1989. Cecilia had a hard childhood and was removed from her home around 1983. She was placed with various foster families and endured sexual and physical abuse. Her cousin Dealey testified at the public inquiry when they came to Smithers. She said that in between caregivers, Cecilia came and stayed with her family. She remembers Cecilia as being a soft and sweet person with a soft giggle. Cecilia was older than her, but she would play dolls with Dealey and brush her hair. It is said that in August 1989, Cecilia boarded a bus for Vancouver. She had plans to go visit her birth mother. They were not close at all. They lost connection when Cecilia was removed from her care. When Cecilia got off the bus, she called her caregiver to say that she made it to Vancouver okay and would be home in a couple weeks. A family member did say they seen Cecilia in Vancouver on August 1st, 1989. Her CBC profile also says that she left her mom's house in October 1989 to live on the streets and that another family member says that she moved to Vancouver Island. When private investigator Fred Maley was looking for her cousin Delphine in Vancouver, he also was looking for Cecilia. The cousins disappeared a year apart. No trace of either girl was ever found in Vancouver. Cecilia's family said she made it home to Smithers and was last seen in 1989 hitchhiking along Highway 16. RCMP says that she was last known to be in Vancouver. Because of this, she is excluded from the official EPANA list. Regardless of this, it has been over 30 years since she was last seen. Cecilia's picture appears on a billboard on Highway 16, warning of the dangers of hitchhiking. The Jack Family The Jack Family was a young family of four who were last seen in the early morning hours of August 2, 1989. The dad of the family, Ronnie Jack, was offered a job by an unknown male he met at the First Leader pub on the night of August 1st. This unknown man also offered his wife Doreen a job and said that the logging camp had a daycare for his two sons, Ryan who was four and Russell who was nine. The man also said they needed to leave that night and because Ronnie and Doreen did not have a car, they had to leave with him that night. They packed enough luggage for two weeks. Ronnie called his mom at about 11 p.m. to let her know what was going on. The entire family vanished after getting into the unknown man's truck. No trace of them has ever been found. Updated sketches of the entire family were done in September 2020 by Samantha Steinberg, who works for the Miami-Dade Police Department in Florida. The new age progressions are the result of the hard work of Marlene Jack who is Doreen's sister. RCMP played no role in the new reconstructions. She will not stop until she has answers about her family's disappearance. Marlene continues to press investigators for updates. The biggest break in the case came when an anonymous 10-second phone call was received by the RCMP that said the family was buried on Gordy's Ranch. This resulted in a search, but nothing was ever found. I covered the Jack family case in my very first episode. I will link it down below if you would like a more detailed account. 
Dina Bream. Dina was 16 years old and lived with her parents in Bushy Lake, about 12 miles from Quinell. Dina was associated with the highway of tears cases for a long time in the media, but was left off the official list in 2007. This is largely due to the road she was last seen on and Highway 97. They are separated by the Fraser River. Dina woke up on the morning of Friday, September 24th, 1999, and was excited because it was her birthday weekend. Her actual birthday being on the following Monday. She went to school that Friday and had plans to stay the night with one of her friends and attend a party that night. Dina and her friends went to the party at a 4x4 track near Quinell, and then everyone wanted to go to another party on the other side of town. Dina was tired and did not want to go to the other party. The friend who she was supposed to stay the night with stayed at the party and Dina caught a ride with another friend to their house. From there, she started to hitchhike home. She was last seen walking north on Fraser Road toward her home in Bushy Lake, in the area of Bartell's Mobile Home Park between the hours of 3 and 4 a.m. on Saturday, September 25th. It was supposedly pouring rain when she decided to start walking home. Early shift workers at a nearby mill reported seeing her trying to hitchhike. Dina would usually call her parents for a ride if she needed one and did not do so this time. Her parents wondered where she was on Saturday and just assumed she was still with the friend. The friend she was supposed to stay the night with called Dina's house for her on Sunday. Dina's parents became very concerned. They tried to locate her before reporting her missing on Monday, September 27th. This was Dina's birthday. Police searches were conducted for a short time with no results. Dina would be missing for about two and a half months before her body was found on Friday, December 10th, 1999, near Pinnacles Park. A hunter had found her remains buried under a pile of brush. This location was in an area previously searched. The search had stopped just 15 meters from where her body was found. She was just 10 kilometers from her home and 15 kilometers from where she was last seen. Her body was severely decomposed and it was impossible to tell if she had been raped. The site was also disturbed by animals or possibly by humans. Dina was positively identified by dental records and the backpack she was carrying that night has never been found. Investigators would like to question two men seen walking down the road the same time Dina was. Public pleas for them to come forward have been unsuccessful. Dina's family still mourn her loss and wish she had been included on the official Highway of Tears list. Bonnie Joseph Bonnie was a 32-year-old mother of five and was from the Yukuchi First Nation. She grew up in foster care and lived in Fort St. James. Her cousin Vanessa described her as being shy, kind, and quiet. She also said that Bonnie was always happy and loved to laugh. She also said that she struggled with addictions and was considering treatment. Bonnie's children were removed from her care sometime in the year 2000, and she fought very hard to get them back. Her children meant the world to her. She never missed an appointment, visitation, or court date regarding her children. She documented her journey and struggles regarding this in a journal. In the journal, she spoke about walking to see her newborn baby to breastfeed. Even though Bonnie did everything that was asked of her, it was very hard to get her children back. I have spoken of this topic before in my MMIW of Winnipeg video. Bonnie was nearing the end of this journey. The court was to decide if she would get her kids back very soon. Bonnie did not have a car and would have to hitchhike to all of her appointments and court dates. She would often thumb a ride from St. James to Vanderhoof and then to Prince George. Most of her travel route would be along Highway 16. She would leave a day early to ensure she never missed her appointments. 
Bonnie was seen for the last time on Saturday, September 8, 2007. She ran into her cousin Joanne at the A&W in Vanderhoof. She told Joanne she was headed to Prince George for a court date. She would stay with relatives in Prince George or at a women's shelter if she arrived into town too late. Bonnie never arrived at either place or her court appointment. Bonnie lived in various places and no one immediately knew she was missing. It wasn't until she missed her next court date in a couple more visits with her kids that anyone knew something was wrong. Her social worker notified her family and they knew something must have happened because Bonnie would never jeopardize losing her kids. Her Aunt Rose filed a missing persons report in December 2007. In between the time she went missing and the missing persons report was filed, Bonnie's wallet was found at a nearby lake. There was an uncashed check in the wallet. Vanessa wasn't sure of the lake but thought possibly Fraser Lake. But Lake Cluclus and Bednesti are in the direction from Vanderhoof to Prince George. Either way, the family did not find out about the discovery of the wallet until a year afterwards. Bonnie's friend India tells of a reoccurring dream she has. She walks into a blue house on the reserve and sees Bonnie sitting in an armchair in the corner. Bonnie says, How long I have waited for you. Then goes on to say she's stuck and can't leave. Bonnie has never been found. She is described as being 5 feet 4 inches tall, 120 pounds, and has short black hair. Her case has received very little media attention. Madison Scott Madison was 20 years old and lived in Vanderhoof with her parents Don and Eldon Scott. On Friday, May 27, 2011, Madison got ready to go camping for the night at Hogsback Lake with her friend Jordy. There was a birthday party there that night. The lake is a popular place for drinking parties and weekend camping. The lake is 25 kilometers from Vanderhoof. The party was advertised on Facebook and over 50 people showed up. Madison was texting her mom until about 11.30 p.m. A fight broke out around midnight and Jordy wanted to leave with her boyfriend after that and asked Madison to come with them. But Madison was already laying down and did not want to pack up her stuff, so she stayed. Reports say that Madison's cell phone got a call at about 12.30 a.m., her mom, Dawn, said she knows who this person is. Madison was last seen at the campsite at about 3 a.m. by other people camped nearby. Her cell phone pinged at about 8 a.m. on Saturday, May 28th. Jordy came back to the campsite at about 8.30 a.m. to get her stuff she left behind. She said Madison was not there and that the tent was unzipped and that everything was pushed over to one side. Jordy just thought Madison went for a walk or something and she continued with her day by going to work. While Madison did not go on a walk and her family did not realize she was missing yet. The lake has spotty cell service and this is the reason why family thought her phone was going unanswered. There was a party at the same spot the next day on Saturday night. Madison's sister was there and seen her sister's truck and tent. Madison was not seen at the second party. Her sister did not initially tell her parents because she did not want to get into trouble for being at the party because she was underage. Madison's tent was actually flattened at this party, possibly disrupting a crime scene. Most everyone was questioned from the first and second parties, but nothing was definitely determined on what happened to Madison. By Sunday, May 29th, Madison's family were getting more worried and decided to drive up to the lake. They found Madison's truck and flattened tent. They called RCMP immediately to report her missing. Items noticed as missing were an iPhone 4 with a bluish green cover and a lanyard with a large bundle of keys. Large scale searches were conducted. They searched the lake, surrounding fields, swamps, and forest. 
They were on foot and horseback and also had divers and cadaver dogs. A helicopter was also used and they went as far as Fraser Lake and Isle of Pierre. Madison has red hair that was shoulder length at the time she went missing. She is 5 feet 4 inches tall and about 160 pounds. There is a tattoo of a bird silhouette on her wrist and her left nostril is pierced. Madison did not have a boyfriend at the time she disappeared. There is currently a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for her disappearance. Someone in the Vanderhoof area knows exactly what happened to Madison. Anita Florence Thorne Anita was 49 years old and lived in Prince George. She was last seen on Wednesday, November 19, 2014. That morning, she was seen at the Super Save gas station on Victoria Street and then at a Tim Hortons drive through She was reported missing later that night at 8.15 p.m. when she never returned home. She was driving a 2013 Ford Escape that was found the next day at Willow River Rest Stop, 35 kilometers east of Prince George. Her car was unlocked and her purse was inside. Nothing seemed to be missing. This location was right off Highway 16 and described as being very eerie and isolated. It was learned that she had the day off from work and had recently said she wanted to go to Willow River to visit a friend's memorial. This could be why it is believed she had her keys, cigarettes, and cell phone with her, as they were not found in her car. A police service dog was summoned to the scene but produced negative results. Searches were also conducted by air and ground soon after and lasted four days. The search was suspended on November 24th. Police at the time said that there is no reason to suspect foul play. But Anita is still missing and has never made contact with anyone she knew. She loved her family and friends very much. Anita is 5 feet 2 inches tall, 145 pounds, and has brown shoulder length hair. She was wearing a white hoodie with a black puffy vest and had her hair in a bun at the time she went missing. Frances Brown Frances was 53 years old and lived in Hagelgett at the time she went missing. This is near New Hazleton. On Friday, October 13, 2017, Frances went to work as usual. Afterwards, she went home and cleaned up her house, then spoke on the phone with family. Everything seemed normal. One of Frances's favorite hobbies was to go mushroom picking. This is what was on her agenda for the next day, Saturday, October 14, 2017. So Frances and one of her friends went out into the woods near Smithers to go pick. Frances was very experienced and dressed well that day for her time outdoors. She knew the area she went to well. It is a well-known picking spot. While they were picking, Frances wandered off. This was not unusual and the friend did not think nothing of it until it was getting dark and time to leave. Historical records say that sunset that day was at 6.31 p.m. Frances's friend said that they waited for her for a while, they yelled out for her, and probably even blew the horn. They then drove into town to report her missing. The official time log for this was 9.20 p.m. Police went to the area she was last known to be and turned on their lights and occasionally let the sirens blare. The friend said that Frances was deaf in one ear, but she functioned well. The RCMP actually started searching right away. Dogs and helicopters were used. One was equipped with thermal imaging. They searched as best as they could from October 15th to October 22nd, which was eight days. Family and friends were also looking at the same time. They set up camp and tried very hard to find her. They even stayed after the RCMP and the Bulkley Valley Search and Rescue quit. 
They stayed until November 11th and only quit because of the weather. Frances is 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighs about 120 pounds. She has long dark hair with some gray. She has never been found, even though the spot she disappeared from is a popular mushroom picking spot. Cindy Martin Cindy was a well-educated woman who once lived in the east side of Vancouver and worked for the school board. She enjoyed working with the youth and many of them have fond memories of her. The thing most people remember about her is her laugh. Cindy also was an MMIW advocate and a member of the Gitsan Nation. Cindy wanted to be closer to family, so she moved back to Hazleton. Right before she disappeared, she spoke to her sister Sheridan and said she was completing a counseling degree online. She also said she wanted to open up a counseling center in her home community to help her people. A little bit after moving back home, Cindy broke up with her live-in boyfriend. They lived just five minutes away from Cindy's mom. After they split up, she went to stay at her mom's. She was very close to her mom, so this arrangement let them spend more time together, which they both enjoyed. Two days before Christmas on December 23, 2018, Cindy spent the evening with her mom and sister watching a Christmas movie. During the movie, her ex-boyfriend called and wanted to know if Cindy could come over and talk. He said his uncle just passed away and he needed her words and guidance. Cindy wasn't sure if she was going to go over there, and being the helping person she was, she decided to go. She borrowed her mother's car at about 9 p.m. and said she would be back in the morning. Noon came around the next day and there was no Cindy. Her mom tried calling her and there was no answer. So at 3 p.m. she sent her son over to Cindy's house to see what was going on. He knocked and there was no answer. It had snowed the night before and he did not see any type of tracks. Cindy's mom kept calling Cindy and the ex-boyfriend. She was really worried and did not have a car to go search because Cindy had borrowed it. The ex-boyfriend finally answered at about 9 p.m. on the 24th. He said he did not see Cindy at all. The family also says that he did not even call looking for her after she did not show up the night before. Cindy's mom was frantic at this point. She knew something was off. It should have only taken Cindy five minutes to drive back to her house and no tracks in the snow indicates that no one was even at the house the night she left to go there. So where did she go? The boyfriend called back after the 9 p.m. phone call and said he would go out looking. Surprisingly, he found the car right away. It was parked near the Hagelgett Canyon Bridge. The car was locked and the keys were inside. There was no sign of Cindy. RCMP was notified and Sister Sheridan said the car was not examined and just towed to the police lot. There are not even any pictures of the car at the place it was found. The family was upset about this because they think the RCMP is implying that Cindy jumped from the bridge. There was a helicopter search on Christmas Day. Nothing was found. Cindy's family continues to search for her when the weather is good. They wish to give her a proper burial. Cindy was 50 years old at the time of her disappearance. She is 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighs about 170 pounds. Her family set up a red dress at the bridge where the car was found to bring awareness to her disappearance. Jessica Patrick Balsher Jessica was 18 years old and a mother to a one-year-old daughter and lived in Smithers. She was a member of the Babine First Nation. Her parents split up when she was seven and she lived in foster care for a while. She moved back in with her dad when she was 14. He cleaned up his life pretty good and provided a good home for her. Her dad had seen her a couple days before she went missing and Jessica agreed to move back in with him. 
She was just couch surfing at the time, and he would feel better if she stayed with him. He was pretty excited about this because he could see his granddaughter more. But unfortunately, this day would not come. On Friday, August 31st, 2018, Jessica dropped her baby off with her grandma for the night in Smithers. She gave her daughter a big hug before she left and said she was going to the Mountain View Hotel. There was a party going on there and the police were eventually called that night for a disturbance. The family got worried when Jessica did not come back because this was not in her character. They reported her missing on September 3rd. They were disappointed because the police said she was probably just still out partying. So the family had to lead their own searches. RCMP claims they searched and obtained search warrants before she was found. On September 15, 2018, her aunt Mary Nicholas and her husband and nephew went on a mission to find Jessica. She asked her husband where the most logical place was near them to dump a body. They decided to head up the Hudson Bay Mountain and pulled into a roadside lookout. This was just 10 minutes outside of Smithers. They were looking around with binoculars when Mary noticed a small trail going down a hill. Her husband said it was just probably an animal track. She made him go down and check. 15 meters down, he discovered Jessica's body, slumped up on a cluster of trees and near a washing machine. She was still wearing her ballerina flats, her tank top was pushed up under her breast, and her hair was fanned over her face. Mary's husband began to scream and yell before running back up. This terrified Mary even more because she said she never heard a man scream like that, ever. Investigators never said if she was raped and no arrests have ever been made in her death. Someone put her down that mountain and seemingly got away with it. When Jessica's family picked her up from the medical examiner in Prince George to bring her home, the smell of death was very strong. Along the way, hundreds of people that lived in the communities along the highway lined up to pay their respects as the hearse passed by with her body. Jessica's daughter and family were robbed of her existence. She loved her daughter very much and will always be with her in spirit. And that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching and let me know what you think about this in the comments down below. And I hope to see you in the next video.